What took three years to build, as we all know, came down in a little less than 17 seconds. And as usual, the Seattle Police Department was in the middle of it all. Good evening, I'm Detective Randy Huserick. Thank you for joining us tonight on Beyond the Badge. We'll take a look at the department's role in the implosion of the Kingdom in just a few minutes. Our Up Close segment tonight takes a look at the department's parking enforcement officers. We'll look at the job they do in and around the city every day. Our neighborhood focus takes us downtown where we meet some West Precinct business owners who assisted the department in the middle of WTO. And later tonight, I'll be joined by Seattle Police Chief Herb Johnson. The department's role in the King Dome implosion was more of a security situation, keeping everyone out of the area when the King Dome came down. Here's Detective Tina Drain with more on the department's role in the King Dome implosion. Thanks, Randy. Our film crew had a chance to record a history-making event. Let's listen to some of the officers' fond memories and talk to some of the people behind the scenes making it all happen. We've been working on this for several months. Um, when we first heard about it, the city started meeting with the contractor and, and starting to iron out the initial um, uh, planning. But the, the real serious planning has occurred probably within the last two or three weeks. But we, we started months ago. Fond memories of the kingdom. Yes, sir. Ken Griffey hit a home run right in my section, and the ball oh, swerved off, and the guy next to me caught it, and not me. Um, in, in comparison to other events that we do in the city uh, uh, annually, I would compare this one to the, the uh, Seafair hydroplanes. Probably we've got about half of what we would, would normally use during a Seafair race, but uh, I think we've got, with all of the precincts, crowd control, traffic control around the immediate area, we're pushing about 300 officers. Well, I came into the traffic division in 1976 when they built the dome, and that's the sole purpose that I came into the traffic division. I was there for 13 and a half years. I got to see a lot of sporting events and make a lot of money doing it, so I have very fond memories. This, this particular incident, it's, it's a unified um, effort. It's not just the Seattle Police Department. It's the um, Seattle Fire Department actually has the lead on it. It's the uh, Washington State Patrol. Department, uh, Washington State Department of Transportation. Um, almost every city department is involved. CTRAN, um, Public Utilities, uh, DCLU, uh, Water, uh, Puget Sound Energy. Um, they all have their concerns. Um, there's the gas mains uh, you know, close by. Um, there's all the utility lines, uh, fiber off of gold, things. I mean, it's, it's, everybody has um, legitimate concerns about the safety of their equipment and, and the, the surrounding buildings in the area. So it's uh, taken a lot of cooperation. It, it's, uh, I think one thing on this one we really have learned is, is, um, is assist me in learning to cooperate or seeing how the city can come together in a unified effort uh, to address an incident or an event like this. It's got to be the 95 season for the Mariners, wasn't it? Sure, and we got we won the American League West, and it was the... Uh, there's never been anything like that in this town, I don't think, except maybe the Sonics when they, they, they took it all in 79. But uh, that season of the Mariners is, I'll never forget. And it all happened right over there. My fondest memory of the Dome, of course, is the fabulous catch by Steve Largent in the end zone in 1986. I, there's a certain amount of interest in this. Uh, I'm not saying necessarily I'm for or against the, the kingdom coming down. There, and that in itself is a controversy. But uh, it's not often that the people in the area will have the opportunity to see a structure of this size uh, be imploded. Um, you know, I, I, when I was early in my career, I. I worked a lot of the, uh, the football games and the baseball games there. And recently I've been doing all, all the traffic control around the Kingdome. So uh, I met some of, some of the people that 
you know, some of the players, and I've uh, met a lot of the uh, employees of the Kingdom. It's, uh, and it's kind of sad to see see that uh, go by the wayside, especially for them, people that you know and work with, and now they're they're elsewhere. So. With me tonight is Sarah Jane Falanca, a resident of the Florentine condominiums, which are directly across the street from what used to be the King Dome. To ensure the safety of the residents during and after the implosion, Sarah worked closely with the contractors for nearly two years planning the event. She's here tonight to share her experiences with us. Thanks for being here tonight, Sarah. You're welcome, Tina. My pleasure. Now, what a lot of people probably don't know is that the Florentine is the only residential building near the Kingdom. Now, that probably created some unique challenges for Turner and for CDI. So what did you do in conjunction with them to make to meet those challenges? Well, the Florentine, uh, about two years ago, established a stadium committee, which dwindled down to just me at the end, and I was doing most of the liaison work for the Florentine that was had everything to do with construction. So when they when they it finally was cited, the stadium was finally cited on the Kingdom site. We knew that there would be some sort of demolition, and once we heard it was an implosion, we started working very closely with First and Goal, the Public Stadium Authority, and Turner Construction. And the community outreach was extensive, and our building was handled slightly differently because we were the only residential building. And they did a, a, a really great job with us. We had a lot of interaction, and things went very well. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some particular things were done for our building. So is this involving the safety and the evacuation aspect of the planning? Is that what you're referring to? There was safety considerations. There were evacuation considerations. And once there were evacuation considerations, there were other considerations that crept up. Like if all of us were going to be evacuated from the building because the building was within a certain area close enough to be evacuated, if we all left, what about our animals? Our animals, there they were in the building by themselves, so we negotiated removing the animals. They left the building on Saturday evening <clears throat> and came back Sunday afternoon. So there, was, there were challenges to, to making sure that the Florentine, this large residential building, was handled properly, and it was. Now, when you were evacuated, where were you evacuated to? We, we were evacuated to just across the street from our building uh, to McCrory's, where First and Goal and Turner very kindly put on a breakfast for us, along with some of their employees. And we had inside viewing from McCrory's and street viewing from Occidental. So we were as close as you could have gotten to the actual implosion. Mm -hmm. Now, what were some of the other preparations that were made to protect your building during the implosion? Uh, there were lots of things. The, uh, the building was completely inspected. That, that was cosmetically inspected inside each one of our units. Plus, it was structurally minimally uh, inspected to see cracks and existing things already so that they knew exactly what our building looked like before the implosion. And then they came back in afterwards and re-inspected. Now, is that the surveying that you were talking about? That's the surveying team that came through, right. Mm -hmm. And that was all provided for by Turner? That was all provided for by someone other than us. I believe mm -hmm. it was Turner that, mm -hmm. that, as the contractor, that paid for that, yes. Now, as you're planning for this, what was the biggest concern? What would have been the worst case scenario for the residents of that building? I think the worst case scenario was, was the thought of vibration. Uh, things flying through the air, and of course, the, the constant talk that Seattle is on an earthquake. Uh, the, in, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A fault. A fault. And that that perhaps that the implosion could create a seismic event. Mm -hmm. But then the University of Washington quickly spoke up and said, "No, it's not going to happen." So I think uh, we were pretty relaxed. And, and CDI did a great job with the building itself. Now, did you observe a lot of the um, coordination between the construction companies and the police department? Personally, no, but I was constantly informed about what was going on between the construction company, police department, and the fire department. And I was always informed as to where the police department was as far as what, was, what safety measures were going to be taken, where the command posts were going to be. And I must say, uh, our street was blocked off for a few days before and about a week and a half afterwards, and the police did a great job mm -hmm. uh, letting us in and keeping 
traffic and onlookers out. Now, the security concerns probably would increase rather than decrease after the implosion. What do you think? It would probably a, a different kind of security uh, problem. The security problem before was the fact that there were explosives on site. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, it was the fact of people getting getting injured because there was all this debris still around. It took mm -hmm. a long time to clean up. Now, it's not over. So what else is happening between the Florentine and Turner construction as this moves forward and the cleanup is done? Well, right now, of course, there will always there will be an ongoing process with Turner as the construction phase goes on. At the moment, it's it's crushing and and dust and dirt, and we knew it, and we're living with it. So, mm -hmm. were there any agreements made regarding how to handle all that dust and dirt, especially with the ventilation problems yes, that would occur? Yes, it was it was part of the uh, the EIS, I believe, or whatever that that the MUP when the MUP was issued that certain things had to be done to make sure that all of the buildings in the surrounding area were clean bef after the implosion, and that did happen. We had cleaning crews in our building for four days cleaning up the outside. Thank goodness they taped our doors and we had nothing inside. Okay. I just have one more question, and that is, from where you were sitting, what was it like for you to see that kingdom come down? It it's was, a pretty impressive picture on, on the screen. It is, and it was truly exciting. I think the CDI did a grand job Alleviating all of our fears, alleviating all of our fears, and making it an exciting day as opposed to an anxious day. We were all, and it was exciting. I, it was probably one of the most exciting things I've ever seen. It's kind of sad that that something, a destruction, can be exciting, but it was. Mm -hmm. Well, it was the magnitude of, of what what we saw in the dust and the darkness and. To be right there, you know, less probably a block away from it, right. had to really be an incredible experience. It was. Thank you so much for being here tonight and Thank sharing you, what happened with the Florentine and with the implosion. Thank you. Okay. Next on Up Close, Detective Randy Curtis talks to you about and with parking enforcement. Gonna go get some lunch and park here. Yeah, I got my permit. My car, my car. It's a rental. We'll be okay. Come on, let's go. Gary and I would never attempt to pull such a ruse on the city of Seattle, and we wouldn't condone this type of behavior. Let's follow along and see what vital, important roles that parking enforcement actually play in the city of Seattle. As parking enforcement officers, we enforce all of the parking ordinances of the city of Seattle. There are about 95 of them. My purpose uh, as a parking enforcement officer is to make sure that there's uh, available spaces for citizens to park uh, downtown or anywhere else that I'm working at. The thing I like most about being a parking enforcement officer is the opportunity to be amongst the public and assist when I'm able. Well, we generated about 446,000 tickets. You probably have more positive people contact in the residential areas rather than downtown. You probably write more tickets downtown, but it's a quicker turnover of citizens.
Yes, I appreciate parking enforcement officers. As a downtown retail store manager, it's important that customers can come in, pay their bills, and get out in a timely fashion. So having parking enforcement officers routinely make sure that people are coming and going is helpful. Okay, the last figures that I recall seeing uh, stated that the PEO unit had written $12.8 million worth of tickets. I'm not sure which year that was for, but that's a substantial figure. My advice I would give him is to make sure you read the whole sign and not what you want to read. You know, when it says 30 minute truck load only, you got to read the truck part, not just say, well, it's a load and unload only zone. And uh, so that's what the confusion is, is they, do, they don't read the whole sign. What I did learn is they're a phenomenal resource, not only to the department and what they can do, but to the community as well. And I also learned that they're a wonderful group of people. They're highly professional. They're out there to help people and, and to, to do the right thing. Well, besides just writing tickets, we assist with traffic control during fires, emergencies, accidents. Uh, we can administer first aid. We assist in locating missing, stolen, lost vehicles, uh, missing and lost children. Uh, we find lost animals. Okay, the biggest misconception I'd like to clear up is the fact that people think we have a quota, and we don't. We're allowed to write as many as we, as we see. You know, if the, if the violation is there, we're there to go ahead and write it. Situations different. You have to kind of get a feel for the, the person in general, let them vet, you know, get out their anger, and issue the citation and leave it at that. Ladies and gentlemen, run to your refrigerator right now with your Indian Eat marker. The phone number has changed. It's 684-8821. We're live in the studio. This is the Up Close segment. We're talking about parking enforcement. I'm excited. Me too. Me too. In the studio with me this evening, I'm proud and pleased to have two very beneficial employees of the Parking Enforcement Unit, Arlene Calderon. Welcome. Thank you. Michelle Hunter, ladies. Hello. The phones are ringing. I'm excited. You guys are ready. Yes. Arlene. Tell us what now can be done about individuals parking in private lots that are using disabled spots and they don't have the permits. There was a time you couldn't go on those parking lots, right? Yes. Um, we can go on the private parking lots now, mm -hmm. uh, like businesses like Safeway, um, Shucks Auto Supplies, uh, hospitals, and uh, libraries. libraries. What's the fine for an individual using a disabled spot that doesn't have the permit? Uh, $250. $250, that's yes. significant. I like that. It's a lot. I like that. Lot. Now, Michelle, describe for those individuals that have a legitimate use for a disabled parking permit, where they can park in downtown, though. There are certain parameters, right? Right. If they're coming to the downtown business districts, the places that they are allowed to park are at the gray meters, mm -hmm. and um, they can park there for as long as they need, but they cannot leave their vehicles on the city streets for more than 24 hours. And they don't have to pay the meter, though, They right? do not have to pay the meter as long as their placard is displayed properly, which would be hanging from the rearview mirror. Okay. Let's go to line one. Hey, Joseph, are you there? Yes. Thank you for calling. Well, my question is, uh, Shoot. what is the rule as far as so-called stuffing the meter? If the meter says it's two hours, can you just keep going back and, uh, and putting money in it, or do you need to move your vehicle after the two-hour uh, expiration? That's a great question. Thank you, Joseph. Well, oh. And you can Michelle, can we stuff the meters? No, you cannot. And there is a violation for feeding the meter. And you can only park there for the time limit of the meter. Okay. And if they stay over that time? You can be cited for feeding the meter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's try. Hey, Carol, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you for calling. What part of the city do you live in? South Seattle. Thank you for calling. What's your question, comment, or idea for us? I'm Michelle's cousin, but I just wanted to say, I want to know if the city has fixed the meter.
meters yet. Have what? they fixed them? You know, there was about a few months ago, the meters were, were not fixed, and we were being charged more for getting less time. That's a great question. And we're going to let Michelle compose herself while she decides what punishment she'll heap on her family for that. <laughs> and Arlene, you want to answer? Uh, yes, the meters have uh, been all completely fixed. Uh -huh. So. Okay. I like that. And no. If anyone has a problem with the meter, they need to contact the meter shop. The Park yeah. Enforcement Unit has nothing to do with the meters. Do we have a phone number for broken meters that we can report? Uh, yes, we do. And uh, I think it is at 684-8763. Yes. That's where we report broken meters. Hey, we'll go to line one. Hey, Margaret, how are you? Good. Thanks for calling. I need to know. Well, we got the answers. Did we get the answer already? No, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. I need to know, how can we get the parking enforcement officers out to check our neighborhood about cars that's being parked or dumped in our neighborhood for weeks at a time? That's a great question, Margaret. Did I ask you what part of the city you live in? Rainier Valley. Thank you for calling, Margaret. Thank you. Michelle? What abandoned. can we do? What can we do about abandoned cars? There is an abandoned vehicle hotline number that they can call. Um, a vehicle cannot sit on city property for more than 24 hours, and if you call that number, make sure you give a complete description of the vehicle, the exact location, a license plate number, and some will, we do have a task force unit, and they will come out and put all the necessary information on the vehicle and cite it and have it impounded. So just like the old Dragnet TV show, just the facts? Just the facts. Just facts. Where is it at? license plate and what the violation the might be right, that you believe is in there. Yeah. Right, right. And also please be very patient because we right, do get patient. hundreds of these calls in a, a day, day. Okay. and uh, we only have a small task force. I like that. Let's ask Rick. Yeah. Rick, thank you for calling. Hello. Hello. Uh, my question is, uh, prior to the 4 o'clock cutoff time, are tow trucks allowed to hook up? You're probably talking about the downtown corridor, Rick? Yes, Westlake area. Okay, thank you for calling. Arlene, sounds like Rick has had a concern about a tow truck hooking up someone. Of course. What do you think it might have been? Uh, if I... Uh, maybe a misread sign is what I'm thinking, perhaps. Um, yes. Sounds Speaking good. of which... <laughs> Speaking you've of You've got which, something, don't you, in your back pocket? Yes, I do. Well, let's take a look. I have a couple signs here. A couple signs here that uh, most people tend to um, uh, not read uh, correctly. Um, this one here, for instance, uh, is a common problem. Uh, people tend to read uh, only 30 minute load and unload between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. and they tend not to read the, uh, what you need to be in this zone. This zone here is a yellow meter with a yellow uh, curbing which is basically for delivery trucks with a business name and truck plates and a special permit. Uh, so you need to read this commercial or permit vehicle load only. And this is a $44 ticket, plus you can get impounded out of this zone. So the lesson that we're going to pass on here is read the whole sign. Read the whole sign. Top to bottom. Top to bottom. I like that. But we'll get ready for another sign in a second. Let's ask Evelyn. Well, more importantly, Evelyn, thank you for calling. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. My question is, what happens when I have received a ticket unfairly? What recourse do I have? That's a great question, Evelyn. Thank you. You're welcome. Michelle, have you <laughs> perhaps ever possibly given a ticket out unfairly? I don't feel it has. I don't think no. I have. But what, you know, in case the citizen If there is a problem might... with a ticket that they have received, they can contact um, municipal courts mm -hmm. at 684-5600. Or uh, they can fill out the back of the ticket and mail it in and request a hearing with the magistrate. And at that time, they have an opportunity to explain the situation to the magistrate. And it was up to their discretion if they will get charged for the fine or it will get dismissed. Arlene, I pull up at the same time that you pull up in your scooter and I'm running to the meter. I know it's expired and I've got my quarter handy. Does Ty go to the runner? How does that work? How that works is if uh, I've already started the citation, I will continue the citation. So once you've laid hands on it. Right. right. Once I've laid hands on it and um, programmed stuff in there, you will get the citation. Mm -hmm. uh, it is my dis discretion whether um, you know I can give you the ticket if I haven't started it or not. Yeah, that's what you were mentioning. that you been able to, I think it was just today you were saying, Michelle, that you were able to pass on a warning. Uh, or a warning, which we are at our discretion allowed to do. And you have that right. Yes. Well, thank you very much, ladies. Hey, I wanted to remind uh, everyone that 
Parking enforcement is a very vital, important role. You guys have done a great job. Arlene, Michelle, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. You're the best. I wish we had more time. We got a lot more signs. You'll come back? Yes. yes. Outstanding. <laughs> and then we'll do like a whole hour. Oh, cool. Oh. I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, next up, ladies and gentlemen, a very powerful 14 minutes of video that we want to share with you. We're going to take you literally behind the badge. We're going to take you beyond the Miami Vice, the dirty, hairy mentality of what is involved when an officer or their family goes through the uh, officer-involved shootings and what the ramifications and outcomes are. It's very important that you watch. Thanks. Hi, I'm standing at the Seattle Police Department's pistol range. I'm also standing about nine feet away from this target. Nine feet is about the average distance between a police officer and an armed suspect during a police shooting. I've also fired 10 rounds in about four seconds. Four seconds is also about the average length of time of a police shooting. The only thing that I've got going in my favor is that this target isn't shooting back at me. You know, one of the purposes of this show is to show you who we are and to explain some of the things that we face as police officers, as well as why we do some of the things that we do. The ultimate act that a police officer can become involved in is a shooting with an armed suspect. The news media, Hollywood movies, and police-related TV shows could lead you to believe that police shootings occur far more than they actually do. An Associated Press study revealed that the majority of police officers nationwide never become involved in a shooting. What we hope to do in this segment is to challenge your perceptions about police shootings. Currently, Joe, we're doing 96 hours of training. It's spread out over a period of approximately two months. No system can ever entirely prepare a person for those issues that they're going to be facing on the street, whether it's the physical issues, the, the distractions, the, the stresses. Well, we can never simulate that much stress in a person or to give them a real feel. We can almost come up to that using some of our simulations and our scenario type of training to instill, at least bring them right up to the edge of that. Uh, I think that the closer we can bring them to that, and that is one of our goals, the closer we can bring them to feeling the stress to feeling the heart race, to having the adrenaline in their system, forcing them to make decisions under those kind of pressures and still have a safe environment, then we do do the best job I think possible to actually prepare them for what it will be like or is likely to be like once they're out there on the street should that occur to them. We try to get as close as we can, whether we can, there, there is no substitute for the actual situation, but other than that, short of doing that, we try to approach it as close as we can and still keep it a safe environment. As far as averages, as far as police shootings take place, they're relatively quick and relatively um, close in distances. But at least 50, 60 percent of the shootings that take place in law enforcement uh, involving deadly force take place inside of a distance of five yards. Uh, they're, they're relatively fast within a few seconds, three, four seconds. There are definitely exceptions to those. On April 18, 1993, I was involved in a shooting at this play field in West Seattle. In the next segment, we're going to hear from three other Seattle police officers who will tell us about their shootings. On January 5, 1985, Officer Mike Severance was involved in a fatality shooting with a robbery suspect. On February 16, 1988, Officer Andy DePola was shot during a gun battle with two bank robbery suspects, one of which was killed. On January 11, 1990, Officer Tom Bacon was shot by an armed suspect. Let's listen as these officers pick up their story at the critical moment. We'll also hear from Dr. Norman Marr, Seattle Police Department psychologist, who will tell us about what most officers go through during and after a shooting. Uh, just then, as I was about to pat the individual down, uh, he backed away from me, pulled out a 45, and said, is this what you want? I'm going to give you this. And he started firing at me. Uh, had my revolver out, 
yelled at the guy to drop it. He didn't. The shotgun was still pointed towards me, and I squeezed off my first shot. Uh, the response from the suspect was he immediately fired another shot. Uh, I fired a uh, second shot with my revolver, and uh, there's absolutely no reaction from the suspect. I thought I'd missed him with both shots. Because I could see guns in their hands and they're wearing masks. Um, and they came in the bank, and when they did, I threw the chair back that I was sitting in. It was on rollers and started going for my gun. And this is all very, very quickly. They come in the door and yell, get down to everybody. And then one of the two guys sees me as I'm trying to drop behind the desk. And he starts running right at me. And that, of course, scared the hell out of me also. In instances where an officer fires a weapon at another individual uh, in the performance of their duty, one, you're dealing with an extreme situation. Our officers do not fire uh, without extreme reason to do that. In fact, there are, there are many more instances in, in SPD of officers who have really waited and tried ev to exhaust every other option before um, uh, uh, practicing that, you know, operationalizing a deadly force use. Um, many more than those, those instances where an officer actually is justified departmentally and legally in, in using deadly force. Um, well, when I opened fire, um, I had uh, apparently hit him one time, but I wasn't even aware of that at the time. There was no, uh, there was no indication that I could see that I'd even struck him. Um, he just kept moving, and uh, I just continued to fire. Uh, in protection of myself. Uh, he eventually ran over the hill and disappeared, and that was the last that I saw of him. Well, I think sometimes there's some confusion over, over as to why officers sometimes fire multiple shots. Um, in my case, um, as I said, I thought I'd only fired twice. It, I ended up finding out that I'd fired five times, and it still hadn't stopped him. Um, so in my mind, I was going to continue to fire until the threat stopped. Um, because we're dealing with uh, the, the necessity of having automatic weapons, and it is something dictated by the, the tenor in the environment uh, on the street, even in Seattle, um, that it means that the number of shots fired is misleading. Um, and, and what you need to look at, rather, is that an officer fires until the situation is made safe. That's the bottom line. And um, you know, unless a person falls down right away and is still and doesn't have a weapon in their hands or available within their reach, that situation is not safe. Um, and then, of course, the shooting starts. I'll tell you the truth, I wasn't scared at that second, and I really didn't hear the rounds. But when they ran out, I could feel the body starting to function a little differently, and I was, I was, I was scared. But, of course, I was scared and then relieved because now they're gone from the bank, and now I'm not in any danger, and nobody here is going to get hurt. But I know now I have to, as a police officer, I have to pursue them. And then I go out the door, and here's this guy sitting on the ground now pointing at a gun at me again, and it's not over yet. I was scared. Uh, I remember uh, when, we act when I actually came around that final corner, and uh, uh, we were in a, you know, a, uh, the final the shootout, the actual shootout. Uh, your mind operates. Uh, so fast, so much faster than normal. I remember uh, I was a single parent, and I remember picturing my, my two daughters. And I remember uh, thinking right then, I said, their daddy's coming home this morning. I'm not going to lose this. Um, the worst enemy an officer has is themselves. The second guessing that goes on post-shooting is tremendous. And a lot of damage can be done to an officer by themselves in second guessing and trying to figure, what could I have done uh, leading up to actually pulling the trigger, what could I have done to obviate the use of deadly force? I ended up standing there after he had uh, run over the hill, uh, just wondering to myself, how did I get myself, you know, how did I let this happen? Um, I was just sort of amazed that it had all happened. Going through a shoot shooting incident uh, changes you. That innocence you once had is gone and you're never going to get it back. Uh, the incident is one that I wish hadn't happened, but it did happen. You know, I was there, I was doing my job. Uh, I mean, nobody wants to shoot somebody, nobody, particularly nobody wants to kill somebody. Um, the suspect dictated the circumstances in this incident. I've been the police chaplain since 1978, so that would be about 22 years. 
Um, the number of circumstances I've been involved in would be very close to 100. Um, that would be all the way from an officer having to take a life uh, versus uh, on viewing an incident, uh, possibly a barricaded uh, uh, individual, um, a number of areas where even coming close to a very critical incident is powerful for the officers involved. Uh, the range of emotions, again, has to do with how prepared they are, how many times they've been through it themselves, uh, depending on whether children are involved, uh, depending, again, on their own sense of uh, preparation or practice. Uh, the more shocking, the more critical, the more unexpected, and the more traumatic the scene is, uh, the more it impacts the officers. These officers are among the lucky ones. They've survived their ordeal, but it doesn't always end that way. Each year, police officers are killed in the line of duty. And among the survivors that are left behind are all the other officers that have to get back into these patrol cars and continue to protect and serve the community. The impact of the loss of a fellow officer on us is tremendous. You know, for whenever there's a loss of an officer, the next day, the next hour, the next minute, there are officers continuing to do that job despite the loss of, a, of someone that was, you know, their brother or sister in the department. And remember, that's a difficult thing to do because they still have to go home to their families when an officer is lost and try and make them comfortable again with the job that they're doing. Because, of course, the immediate thing would be to say, you know, you got to get out of that job, you know, people, an officers, but they do it. You get out there every day, you still do it. And that takes an incredible amount of courage. I've been with the department since uh, 84, and I've known of four officers that have lost their lives, and uh, I was devastated to find out that we had lost an officer. It was like losing a family member. You're just kind of... It's hard to explain. You just you realize that you have to go out and handle calls, but but uh, you realize that you have a job to do, and you and you go out and do the best you can, being as careful as you can, that you're able to return home to your family. That's what it's all about. And I believe that as everyday people, we have a huge impact for our officers as they're working. I think that we don't know what to do, you know, as an everyday person, what can we do? And I think to me it can be something as basic as letting them know, appreciating. Our officers never hear that we appreciate them. When they hear anything, it's usually because a complaint, you know, a, a call hasn't been handled right or they weren't spoken to or whatever it might be. And those are the type of calls that will come in and the supervisors will hear and then that's what the officer hears. And I think that we have a wonderful opportunity that if we see them on the streets and they're working to just go up and say thank you or to be able to go up and acknowledge their loss. Say, you may not even have known um, John Bananola. You may not even have known Antonio Terry. But we know that this affects you and your job, and we want to let you know we're so sorry. And I think we can do that for them and give them the validation that they need and that emotional support that they need to go through their hard times. In the law enforcement community, we have a saying that all we want to be able to do at the end of our shift is to go home, to be with our families. But what about the officers who don't get to go home? It's not only the officer lost in the line of duty, but the surviving family who also make the ultimate sacrifice. Um, why him? I just, I, I couldn't figure out why. I mean, he was only 15 minutes from home. He was doing a last check-in at the precinct, and he was on his way home. And I, I just, I didn't understand. I didn't understand why, you know, he's 36 years old. It's not supposed to happen. And, you know, and, and then I'm thinking, what am I going to tell my kids? And that was devastating. How do I tell my kids? You know, they were three and one. I, I, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't put my, my mind together enough to figure out what was I going to do. I really felt just lost. I lost.
It's been four months since the WTO conference took place here in Seattle. In the midst of it all, something that we take for granted on a daily basis became a precious commodity for officers working the front lines of crowd control. The break. Officers, in many cases, were working 12 to 18 hour days. Coming to their rescue with food, beverages, and restrooms were several downtown businesses. Tonight, we'll meet some of those business owners and hear why they came to the rescue of these officers. And we'll meet several officers who were recipients of that goodwill. Uh, during that, that first really busy day on Tuesday, most of us hadn't had the opportunity to eat or uh, get anything to drink before we had to respond out on the street to assist in the situation that we had there. But I'd really like to thank them and say thanks for the food, all the people that stepped out of their businesses even during the chaos and offered us places to go to the restroom, uh, rinse our faces off, give us a little food, a little water. We really appreciate it. You really came through in the clutch. And while I was out delivering, I heard on KVI on the John Carlson show that, hey, the police had been out there for 12 hours without food. And I was so appalled by that that I came right back here we made up a dozen pizzas, and I called up the West Precinct. I was ready to go out and deliver them corner to corner. And at first, they loved that idea. And then they decided, you know, that might not be the safest thing in the world. Just bring them to the precinct, and we'll spread them around. And I was happy to do that. And then uh, a sergeant called me up just about a half hour after we closed and told me he had 15 officers who hadn't eaten all day. So I reopened and, you know rolled up the sleeves and made some dinner for him and, and had a great time talking to him for about 45 minutes. And, and I gave out, oh, I don't know, during the week I gave out about 40 free pizzas. And then, of course, KVI started working in with me and, and telling people to call in and order pizzas for the police. And people ordered something in the neighborhood of 250 pizzas that week. We, we lost count. We were, we were busy enough delivering pizzas to the police. We lost count. We don't know exactly how many, but... The, the community outpouring of support was just heartwarming. We don't even know some, some of the people that were coming up to us, but we were offered uh, uh, drinks, uh, food, and any other uh, assistance they could give us, just a place to sit down and use their restrooms. Uh, and I just uh, want to thank, thank all the businesses down there that supported us during WTO. Well, outside my office window, I was able to see, uh, obviously, right at the corner of 4th and Pike, the, the main turmoil where they had a couple lines set up and they were stopping the, uh, the protesters. Uh, and I was watching officers get things thrown at them uh, and bottles and, and cans and, and uh, being yelled at. And, and it personally disgusted me. I felt terrible for the uh, police officers. Well, at one point in the afternoon, there was a lull. Uh, uh, during the uh, kind of siege, I would guess I would say, and, and I heard uh, on my floor, I'm on the second floor, I heard uh, commotion and there was a number of officers that had, had come into the building. And so I came out of my office to see what was going on and it just turned out that they really need to use the restroom. They'd been on the lines for hours and hours. And so I, I went and uh, opened up the restroom for them. There was a couple female officers, so I took them upstairs and opened up a restroom for them. And uh, as I was talking to some of the guys, I realized yeah, they hadn't eaten in some, some between 12 and 14 hours and didn't have a whole lot of food. I gave them some beef jerky that we had from Costco and a couple six-pack of Diet Pepsi, and they stood in line uh, about 20 at a time to use the restroom and, and eat what they could. Um, we were out on line on Tuesday uh, for about eight hours. No breaks, no coffee, um, gas is flying all over the place. Had a break, sat my guys down on the curb. Some gentleman came out from the Union Square building and said that I've got some cheeseburgers coming from Union Square Grill. Um, I had like a five minute break. He said they'd be there in 15 minutes. I held my guys there because I knew that was the only food we were gonna eat for the day and that's what it was. We, that was the last time we ate. So I don't know who the gentleman was, but I'd like to thank him. What I was seeing throughout the week was pandemonium. I mean, it was pandemonium everywhere. Uh, the hotel was under siege at one point starting on Tuesday. Uh, we had police uh, presence here in the lobby. Um, but what we noticed as time went on was that, that there wasn't any breaks for these people, uh, for the men and women uh, of law enforcement that day. And what I saw was uh, a lot of uh, people that were being rotated in and out from the skirmish lines uh, and just sitting down. There was no water, no food, no breaks. Uh, and that's when we kind of stepped in. All the, the uh, myself and the sheriff and staff decided 
hey, these people need a break. I mean, they're, they're out there standing. At this point, it was almost 12 hours, uh, had been standing on a line on their own. Uh, I talked to uh, Lieutenant Steve Paulson, who was our venue commander at the time, and with his coordination uh, through the troops and through the coordination through our staff, we were able to set up a, a food line for him, basically, a break area. Uh, we set up a 24-hour uh, coffee uh, station for him, and we also had uh, sandwiches and chips and like a little deli going for him. Well, my gut feeling of watching these people out on the front line was these people are out there standing tall, standing brave, standing proud, taking unbelievable grief from the aggressors. Um, I was seeing things like uh, verbal abuse, spitting. I mean, it was just amazing what these people were taking. And I really felt for these people. I mean, they were, they were out there for the city without a lot of support. Um, and that's when we decided to help them out as, as much as we could. On the 30th, I was at Fifth and Union, and there were two businesses there at the corner. One was a coffee bar, and the other one was a Eddie Bauer, who assisted us greatly and gave us food and also let us use the bathroom at times, too. I just want to thank the folks at the Sheridan and all the businesses downtown that, that helped us during WTO. Back Theater, despite the fact that they were being closed down and losing money, uh, were very nice to us, provided us a place to come in, get warm, have coffee, and use the restrooms, and this was very nice of them. I really appreciate the uh, business businesses in that uh, area that pro accommodated us, and that, that uh, reinforced why we were down there to protect the law-abiding citizens and, and the businesses. And now, let's go back to the studio with Detective Steve White, who's with one of those business owners that helped out in the middle of WTO. Steve? Here we are back in the studio after a powerful piece about the WTO, and I'm joined with Mr. Mark Franklin. Uh, Mark, could you tell us who you are and how you happen to be here? Well, I'm the director of security at the Sheridan Hotel here in Seattle, um, and I was asked to come down and talk about what happened during WTO. And we really appreciate it. And also in the studio with this is Lieutenant Steve Paulson, who was the venue commander at the Sheraton during the WTO. At this time, I'd like to ask them uh, for some of their impressions and feelings about what actually happened at the WTO. Mark, could you give us uh, just kind of a, a Reader's Digest condensed version of mm -hmm. what happened and what your role and what the Sheridan's role was during the WTO? Sure. Well, uh, what we saw when the, the pandemonium broke uh, was uh, I saw a lot of people that were on the skirmish lines and it really reminded me of, of when I used to play football. I used to be in a lot of equipment sitting out in hot sun or sitting out in weather. And that's exactly what I could think of uh, looking at the people that are on the skirmish lines. Everybody's in riot gear, that kind of thing. And uh, I just was feeling for these people. I mean, they, they were out there standing for what seemed like 12, 14 hours. Nobody, I saw people getting breaks, but I didn't see anybody getting water, you know, bathroom breaks or food or anything. Uh, and that's when we decided uh, at the hotel that we were going to step in and, and do what we could. Steve, he talks about people not getting breaks or when they did. You know, until the Sheridan stepped in, what was an officer able to do during the break? Well, um, the men and women of the Seattle Police Department were under some very challenging circumstances, as were the businesses and um, the other citizens of the city at that time. Uh, Basically, we had a, a situation where some of our supplies were overtaken by some of the protesters. And the Sheridan knew about that, and they stepped right up to the plate and basically um, did what they could to take care of our police officers. Well, the Sheridan stepped up to the plate. How did you do it, Mark? Well, we got, I got together with uh, Lieutenant Paulson here, and uh, he was able to coordinate with mm -hmm. the uh, officers. Mm -hmm. And then I got with my staff, and we, we coordinated uh, with the uh, executive banquet chef, who's mm -hmm. uh, Dave Metzel. Mm -hmm. um, and we got him a, a coffee cart outside the uh, front doors. And then in the alcove area, I don't, I don't know if you've ever been to the hotel, but the alcove area were, uh, near the front doors, we had set up sandwiches and mm -hmm. like a deli. Um, mm -hmm. And an and ability for them to come in with uh, and close the doors and be able to be kind of reclused for a little bit, be able to get some kind mm -hmm. of relief. Uh, and then the food was there if they needed to grab it and, and go back to the line or anything. It was just, it was convenient for them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so now we the situation has changed. We have some relief, a place for the obstacle, a, a sanctuary essentially away from the mayhem that's out there on the street. Uh, Steve, 
how did you feel being in charge of a, a group of people at that venue who now had, and, and these weren't just your officers, just Seattle Police Department officers. You had people from other agencies there, didn't you? Oh, and, uh, there was an incredible number of officers that came through the venue site for relief. Um, I remember the State Patrol, the King County mm -hmm. Police Department, or Sheriff's Department, mm -hmm. I should say. Um, other neighboring jurisdictions were all there um, uh, because I knew that they could find relief inside the Sheridan Hotel during this very chaotic time. Now with the Sheraton providing uh, the kind of relief that it did for the officers working that venue and those that, that managed to find their way to, do you, how do you feel this affected officers at the other venues? Was there an opportunity to distribute things that not have to worry about the Sheraton quite so much? I, I believe that um, even some of the other venue sites had difficulties mm -hmm. uh, with getting supplies to them because of uh, the actions of the protesters. So we had officers from the other venue sites um, also coming toward uh, mm -hmm. to the Sheraton for mm -hmm. that relief also. Mm -hmm. um, it was just amazing um, the outpouring that the Sheraton did during that moment. I spoke with you before we came on the air, Mark, and, and one of the things that struck me is this was a spontaneous thing. Did you have any contingency plans in effect so that you were prepared to do this for the officers before this all started? No, this was this was something new. This is something that it just came up, um, but we were able to rally to the cause and really and really take care of uh, what was needed at the time. Yeah. And when you're in a hotel, there's food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm absolutely struck by the uh, by the sense of empathy that you you evoke. You know, when you talk about your days wearing heavy gear out and out in the weather and understanding that, and how you realize the need for a break, just a moment away. Or, or to take care of certain necessities. Um, you know, that's something that some people don't see. They see the shell, they see the outside, but you looked mm -hmm. at the human component, and I personally want to thank you for that. And I know that in talking with Lieutenant Paulson, he has some uh, feelings on that. Could you tell us, I mean, how this all relates to you now? Well, uh, every time I think about that, um, that trying week, um, I can say wholeheartedly on behalf of the men and women of the Seattle Police Department, um, we are eternally grateful to you, the Sheridan Hotel, but also the businesses in the city of Seattle that um, came out and gave us a, a lot of support during a very trying time. It really meant a lot to those officers and, and to everyone else mm -hmm. involved, and so thank you very much. Yeah. I want to extend my thanks for this, and while we're saying thank you to you, I also want to say that we have a piece uh, about the communication section, There's people for whom all officers and all employees of this department can be truly thankful. Your undivided attention, please. Nine and one. Yeah, I don't know how to uh, go about this, but um, I'm having a problem. The Seattle Police Department Communications Division is currently seeking qualified applicants for the position of Police Communications Dispatcher. Police dispatching is both challenging and rewarding. The Seattle Police Department handles a large volume of emergency and non-emergency calls. Many of these calls may involve pressure, stress, and emotion. This position requires you to use questioning and probing skills to draw out specific information from callers. You are responsible for making quick and accurate decisions while remaining calm, empathetic, and courteous, even when the caller is not. The communication center operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Dispatchers work eight-hour shifts and are on a 5-2-5-3 work schedule. Benefits include retirement, deferred comp, and full medical and dental coverage. The required qualifications for police dispatcher are typing speed of 35 words per minute accurately, be willing to work rotating shifts, weekends, and holidays, pass a work-related performance test, background investigation, and psychological test, pass a drug test and hearing and vision tests by a city-approved doctor. Dispatchers earn between $14.57 and $20.85 per hour. To apply, call 206-684-7999. Joining me tonight in the studio is Sergeant Steve Anderson from the Se Seattle Police Department Recruiting Unit. Uh, what most people don't know about the Seattle Police Department is there's a little more to it than just picking up a phone and uh, taking an applicant. Uh, what different steps do, does your unit uh, handle with getting uh, more recruits? 
Actually, I'm responsible for uh, two different functions in the police department. I have the recruiters, which I have two detectives who uh, recruit full time. Um, their responsibilities are to bring qualified applicants into the Seattle Police Department. I also have the responsibility of uh, the backgrounding unit. I have uh, 10 detectives there who do background investigations on all police officer candidates as well as all civilians who enter the Seattle Police Department. I see. And when somebody goes and applies for the police department, what type of feedback are they expected to get from us? Um, actually, the, the testing process is quite lengthy. Um, actually, the testing and the backgrounding process is quite lengthy and quite extensive. Um, it often will take us um, several months, often four months or so, to actually complete a background investigation. Um, it begins, obviously, with civil service. They uh, take a civil service test. We give those uh, four times a year here in the city of Seattle. They take the civil service test, which is a written examination and uh, a physical test. Uh, upon passing those tests, they, um, if they pass with uh, a, a score of 70, they make the civil service register. We, in turn, um, get a certified list from civil service, and then we begin our backgrounding process. Um, the backgrounding process is very extensive. It, it involves a, a polygraph. Um, an oral board in front of three police officers, an individual interview with the background detective themselves. We do a complete records check, everything from driving records to criminal history to uh, financial reports. Um, and we do uh, a complete reference check. We contact uh, their last five employers, we talk to family members, we talk to friends. Um, and then if they meet the criteria, um, they meet the, the basic job um, skills, the job dimensions, then we'll actually offer them conditional employment, providing they pass the psychological testing, um, which is both a, a set of six written tests, an interview with a psychologist, and then a complete top to bottom, inside to out medical physical. And at that point in time, we'll actually offer them a job as a, a police recruit. Wow, certainly a long process. It is. How many people do you estimate that you uh, go through a testing process for each year? Last year, I, we processed about 3,500 people wow. to hire 100 police officers. So wow. uh, we actually hire, um, I believe it's a little less than 3% of the people that we actually test at civil service. Unbelievable. Now, undoubtedly, we expect certain standards from our applicants and, well, the ones that we hire. So. Maybe we could take a look at some of the job dimensions that we expect and go through them so that the people who might be interested in applying can get an idea of what we're looking for. Sure. We have uh, basically 15 job dimensions that we uh, require our candidates to meet. Um, and um, I'll just run down the list. Some of them are pretty self-explanatory. You have communication skills, the ability to solve problems, um, your ability to learn. As a police officer, you're constantly having to keep updated with laws and changes in the way that uh, we do business. Um, judgment under pressure. Obviously, you have to make snap decisions. You have to make the right decision very quickly. Um, observational skills, your ability to pull everything in and make a decision from that. Uh, an important one is uh, the willingness to confront people. This is a, con a confrontational occupation. You have to have that ability. Um, your interest in people, that empathy, which goes a long way for making a good police officer. Um, interpersonal sensitivity, uh, desire for self-improvement, um, obviously your appearance, your dependability. We need somebody who's going to come to work every day and do a good job for us. Um, your physical ability. This is a physically demanding job, and you have to be able to meet those requirements. Um, utmost and probably our biggest eliminator is uh, integrity. You must have, you must be an honest person, and you must have uh, personal integrity. Um, if you're going to serve as a police officer. That folds into your credibility as a witness in court. And uh, then the last one is uh, operation of a motor vehicle. Um, and that, that job dimension tells us a couple of things. One is, is can you drive a police car mm -hmm. and can you do it safely? And it also tells us um, uh, about their judgment. Um, can they make the right decision at the right time? Sure. So. Very important. Mm -hmm. Very important. Uh, you know, I understand that the background process is very lengthy with not only police candidates but for other people as well. Who, who else do you, does your unit 
uh, require have a background check and how do you go about completing those? Well, we background police officers and, and that's, those actually fall into two categories. We have uh, police recruits, which are basic entry level police officers who um, have no police experience. Um, by agreement with our union, we, entered, we can hire 30 lateral police officers. Those are experienced police officers who have uh, certification with the state and uh, have two years of experience. Um, and then we background all civilian employees and that involves everything from dispatchers to um, administrative specialists to uh, the fellows who run the video unit. Um, we do a background on all of those people. We background uh, even the volunteers um, that come or interns that come to work for the police department. Wow, so much involved. Um, right now we're going to give you a phone number as well as a website that the Seattle Police Department does uh, have that you can get a lot more information from. Thank you so much for joining us in studio. Now we're going to go with uh, Randy Huser, who will be talking with Chief Johnson. I'm Officer Jonathan Young with the Seattle Police Department. We're looking for qualified law enforcement officers to fill new positions. If you're 21 years old, have a high school diploma or GED, are a U.S. citizen with no felony or domestic violence convictions, you may qualify. We're offering stability, security, full benefits, and retirement. If you like challenge, variety, helping people, and the idea of making a difference in your community, call the Seattle Police Department at 684-5473. And now joining me in the studio is Police Chief Herb Johnson. Chief, thanks again for joining us this well, month. Thank you for inviting me again. Great. Um, well, you've had about six weeks back in the department with us, and you and I were just talking backstage. The question you've asked yourself, I'm going to ask you out loud. At this point in time, what made you want to come back and accept this challenge? Well, <laughs> that is a question <laughs> I've, I've asked myself. Actually, after six weeks, I, I enjoyed very much being back in the department. Uh, at the time... Uh, uh, that I was offered the position by Mayor Schell, I thought that uh, you know I would be able to offer some stability to the department. That I'd be able to, since I knew most of the managers, I know a lot of the officers. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd be able to kind of bring the police family together, and kind of be a bridge to the new chief when the search committee uh, uh, finally selects one. Okay, and speaking of selecting a chief. Uh, Recently in, uh, I can't remember which one of the papers I read it in, was that the consultant that had been hired to help us find a chief has now been fired. <laughs> Where is the process in hiring a new chief at, you know, now at this juncture with that change? Right. Well, the search committee is still functioning. And uh, I, I think uh, probably later in the week, the mayor will be making a decision as to which search firm will be working mm -hmm. with the search committee to select a new chief. So that's an ongoing process. So it's, so it's just a hurry up and wait process at this point it in time? It is, it is, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, with your, like I said, you've been here for about six weeks and already the department's about to do some restructuring. Right. Um, how is this gonna affect the department and then how will this affect the way the department serves the city? Yeah, uh, the department was looking at a restructuring simply because uh, in the next month or so, we'll be appointing an, uh, uh, a director of the Office of Professional Accountability, mm -hmm. and that required some restructuring. So what we did is we've taken a look at the department structure, and in looking at it, we found one bureau chief uh, was in command of about 60% of the department officers. That's too great a span of control. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we divided that bureau, and uh, we've also uh, realigned the uh, bureau so that they fit with the city's new lines of business uh, budgeting system. And I, th I think what it's going to do is it's going to give a more effective and more efficient uh, span of control among all five of the bureau chiefs. So it's really kind of streamlined the process within the department yes. itself. And so with the community really isn't going to see any changes in how we're serving them. This is kind of just a, an internal thing. Oh, not, the community won't see a, see a thing. I think the officers will benefit because they're going to be seeing their assistant chiefs more often, more frequently. And uh, I want the assistant chiefs to be out visiting their various units, and I think mm -hmm. they'll be able to have that time once the reorganization is put in place. Okay. 
Now, there has been talk of the department beginning to use a new performance evaluation system for their sworn personnel, the officers, detectives, sergeants, everyone down the line. Where's that right now? Well, what I understand is uh, over the past few years, the performance evaluation system just fell by the wayside. So the department has been uh, looking at various performance systems that exist and is just about to go into a trial run, I think around the 1st of June, of a performance system that seems to meet all of our needs, will be easy to use. Uh, I think it's one that uh, the officers and, and those people who've looked at it feel very comfortable with and think that it'll be a big plus for the department and the employees. Okay. Um, there's been a lot in the media recently, uh, television, print, you know, pretty much anywhere you turn, about police conduct or in some instances police misconduct nationwide. How does this sort of negative press toward law enforcement officers affect the officers here on the Seattle Police Department? And what do you think this does to the community's confidence in the department? Yeah, I, one thing I know from my own family is my wife watch, watches television and she can see an incident occur in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago. And as far as she's concerned, it's right around the corner. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this impacts uh, everybody in, in Seattle or all over the nation. We watch television and we see, especially crimes, uh, they, they come at us through the television set and we think, hey, this is right in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Well, it has a big impact uh, because, of course, the media frequently fo focuses on the bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it does, it does impact us. What has happened in the Rampart Division of Los Angeles, that has its effects on the Seattle Police Department. People are thinking what happened in Los Angeles could easily happen mm -hmm. here. What happened in New York also affects not only the department, but the minority community here who's, who say, well, it may have happened in New York, it could happen here. So it should, you kind of feel that it, it would indeed have some impact upon those communities who could see it, it, it could happening here? And I think that's why it's so important for the Seattle Police Department to continue to work with community groups. It's very important for all of us that our police officers have strong relationships with all the communities in Seattle, and we're working hard to maintain and even expand those relationships. Now, do you feel that because there are law enforcement officers involved at this point in time, do you think some of those issues have a tendency to be over-sensationalized um, merely because there's law enforcement involved, or is that kind of where we've gone with media coverage on just about any issue? Yeah, I think that's where we've gone with the media coverage. It's uh, sensationalism that sells uh, not only in the, in the media, but also in the newsprint. Uh, is there's an awful lot of competition today, and, and not only are the uh, newspapers competing with each other, the TV stations, but the Internet is out there, mm -hmm. and it's a, it, it's a big source of competition to both TV and the news media, I mean newsprint industry. And kind of on the judicial side of law enforcement, a ruling yeah. that just was handed down about a week and a half, two weeks ago, and it was actually a unanimous ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court that states that police generally cannot stop and search someone for a gun, and I want to make sure I read this right, based on an anonymous tip that accurately describes a suspect, their clothing, and current location. Now, as any police officer knows, many a crime has been solved via the route of the anonymous tip. Absolutely. Uh, you know, from some of the most horrible crimes that we witness to, you know, everyday right. petty property crimes. How will this decision affect what officers do here in Seattle and, and around the nation every day, the yes. simple job that they do? Well, I think once the court hands down a decision like that, we must comply, and we will. But it will have an effect on, uh, the, the, you know, there will be some crimes that probably won't be solved mm -hmm. simply because we cannot use this tool that we've had in the past. Okay, well, Chief, I want to thank you very much for joining us again this uh, month. I hope you'll, you'll come back here in the near future. I certainly will. Great. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for watching Beyond the Badge this evening and hope that you'll join us next month, Tuesday, May 2nd, for a very special episode of Beyond the Badge. We'll be celebrating our second anniversary. We're going to show you some of our favorite shows and some of our favorite stories and show you a few things that you haven't seen before. For all of us here at Beyond the Badge, I'm Detective Randy Husrick. Good night.